Welcome to the Resilient Performance Podcast. This is Greg Spatz. In this week's episode, the three of us sit down with the Columbia University Doctor of Physical Therapy program to go over our perspectives on practice. This was a particularly fun episode for Trevor, Doug, and I since we all met at Columbia PT School just prior to starting Resilient. We had a great time talking with the student-led group of future therapists and are excited to see where they are headed in their careers. We hope you enjoy. Here's Greg Spatz, uh, Doug Ketchigen, and Trevor Rappa. Um, they are Columbia alumni uh, from classes of 2014 and 2015 and are also um, founders of Resilient uh, Performance Physical Therapy. Um, they have sites in NYC and Chatham, New Jersey, uh, where they work with a wide range of um, patient populations, including adolescents, um, active adults, um, aging athletes, elite competitors, all along the uh, spectrum of performance and uh, rehab. Um, before I hand it over to them, just a few housekeeping things. Um, please make sure that you are on mute throughout the talk. Um, there will be a chance towards the end to ask questions and you can use the raise hand function. We'll be able to call on you and you can unmute and ask your question. Um, but if you have questions during the talk, uh, feel free to use the chat box and we'll try to get to it um, during the session. Um, also note that uh, this uh, session is recorded for educational purposes. So if you wanna uh, mute your video or change your name, feel free to do that. Um, and without further ado, please uh, join me in a warm round of virtual applause uh, for our speakers. Well, uh, yeah, Stephen, thanks so much for the introduction. It's obviously uh, some, some strange times now, but I'm glad we're doing this. And it's my understanding that this is mostly Columbia students. So um, I'll, I don't want to do too much story time because I want to give you all kind of more actionable information and things that you can actually apply and think about. But just for, for some context, you had mentioned that, you know, um, we're all Columbia alums, Greg, Trevor, and myself. We have locations in New York and New Jersey. Um, you know, as I'm going to talk about, like, I think that people get typecasted into doing certain kinds of PT. And those, those typecasts can be useful just to provide some clarity, but they're also very incomplete. And I'll kind of speak more on that later. But we are, you know, for all practical purposes, more like outpatient orthopedic uh, sports minded PTs. And the backstory on how we, we came to be was that um, I was a year ahead of Greg and Trevor at Columbia. And one day I was in the library, Hammer, which I'm sure has probably changed a little bit, you know, through some re uh, re uh, renovations, but, you know, fundamentally the same thing is where everybody goes to in between classes and to cram in all that information. And I was, uh, I was studying in between classes and I remember seeing somebody with a Mike Boyle strength and conditioning uh, t-shirt. And I kind of had a feeling right away that this was somebody who was probably in, um, in the PT program. And as you all know, there isn't a lot of uh, cross mingling between the different classes. So even though we're kind of all part of the same program, you really spend most of the time with your own class. But I, I went up to Trevor, who I didn't know at the time, and I was kind of like, who are you? And you know, why are you wearing this, uh, this shirt? Because I had interned prior to, to PT school at a, um, another strength and conditioning facility pretty close to Mike Boyles. Um, and they, they both had a similar reputation and similar type people that were attracted to those experiences. And so Trevor told me that, you know, he was a, he was a, a DPT one, I was a DPT two at the time. And we ended up talking and it turned out that we shared a similar interest in kind of lending performance training with physical therapy. And during that conversation, he told me about Greg, one of his classmates, I think they were roommates at the time actually. And Greg, um, prior to P physical therapy school was um, a strength and conditioning coach for the Arizona Diamondbacks in major league baseball. So we cultivated a friendship initially that turned into a business relationship. And I, our intent was, wasn't necessarily to work together as quickly as we did, um, but we always thought in the back of our minds, like it would be great if we could start off doing what most new grads normally do and then find a way to work together. And without getting into too many details, we ended up sort of getting forced into working together probably earlier than we were ready to. Um, and things worked out really well, but you know, when it comes to business, and I'll talk about this more, like you really, you can't script things. And no matter how many times people try to reverse engineer the process and tell you, like, this is what I did. Everything always looks very clear and linear 
when you're retrospectively uh, kind of narrating it. But that clarity does not exist when you're going through that process. Um, so, you know, it's almost like everything looks causative when you're like, well, we did this and then we did this, but it wasn't causative. There's a lot of luck. There's also some hard work and skill involved, but you know, there's a lot of just like fortuitous things that have to happen in business. And we actually, we got forced into it earlier than we probably, like I said, were ready for. And we stumbled upon success, if you want to call it that, because we really didn't have a choice. We didn't know what we were doing and we ended up without a facility and we had to kind of figure things out on the fly. And um, when you're in a kind of survival situation, you kind of just have to adapt. And luckily we did. And so that was um, almost like five years ago now, which is crazy. And now here we are trying to do business in a, uh, a pandemic with some social unrest in one of our <laughs> in the cities that we're located. So uh, it's, it's very challenging, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. And despite like the, the hardship of, of, you know, the good thing about being running your own practice and being in business with yourself is that you control everything. And that's, you have autonomy. And that's also the hard part because like right now, you know, we're, we're facing challenges just like everybody else is. And no one's going to solve our problems for us. We have to, um, we have to solve them ourselves. And even things like, you know, do we want to really aggressively pursue a New York location when, you know, regardless of what's been going on the last couple of days, even with a pandemic, like until there is, you know, reliable and valid testing or a vaccine, even if, you know, um, local state and federal governments open things up for business like if they open up restaurants and offices there's going to be like a a bottom-up regulation where people just don't feel comfortable coming into places that have large population densities and so it's even right now like we don't have the answers we're trying to navigate as we go along we we even before this happened we had aspirations of getting into the digital space and one of the the benefits of the you know the, the time off during the pandemic was that we were able to finally finish some projects we've been working on. And so we made the best of the opportunities, but there's, um, there's a lot of uncertainties. But like I said, the, the flip side is I could be working for a large facility and I could be furloughed right now. And um, you know, my, my fate, my professional fate would be in, in somebody else's hands. So the same things that kind of give me pleasure and joy also keep me up at night. Um, but for now it's, it's still, um, you know, been kind of a, a great experience and it's, it's the, stories really yet to be written. Um, I know that there were some, I, I received some, um, some questions and topics that the audience was interested in prior to, you know, to getting on here. So there are certain things that I want to touch on. And one of them, you know, there was interest in kind of the business aspect of things. I don't want to make this like a business talk per se, because I don't think that, especially like when I was in the seat that you all are in, I had the context to really understand the specific aspects of the business but I think I can get into like some of the general things. Um, so one thing is, and no matter who you talk to, like everyone's going to have a different idea, but I think that when it comes to, to business in, in any field, in, including PT, and there's also obviously, you know, some discussion of, well, do we even want to call healthcare a business? And there's some semantics with that. I kind of look at it like because money's being exchanged, no matter who's paying for it, whether it's a third party, the government out of pocket, it, it is a business and we can, you know, as much as I believe that people should have unlimited access to healthcare and that, that, that socioeconomic status and some of those things shouldn't be an obstacle to receiving healthcare, at, at, at a certain point, somebody is paying for that service. So to pretend that like healthcare is not a business, I think is a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's kind of naive in a way. And so I think we have to face the reality that it is a business. And with any business, I think that you have to have a, a good product. So there's plenty of like courses that are focused on the business side of PT. And we're actually going through a business mentorship ourselves because I think that we'd kind of reached a plateau for where we were and it's been helpful. But I think what got us to that plateau point was that we were, you know, in my opinion, good clinicians. And so that's why what you're doing right now is very important because if you're not a good clinician, you know, there, like you, can, you can be a subpar clinician and make money and be successful if you want to call it that, but it's much harder. Um, and, you know, I think that like for us, most of our businesses come from word of mouth referral. We've done very little direct marketing. If you do a good job with people and they trust you and they think that you're competent and ethical, that, that like kind of network effect just grows and grows in a way that I don't really understand, uh, frankly. But I know that every time somebody submits their information to our website, we can see how they found out about us. And like 90% of the time, it's 
word of mouth. We have a couple of, um, and it's not even so much referrals from like other healthcare providers. It's usually referrals from other patients. We do have other healthcare providers that refer to us, but even that started out as a genuine relationship where maybe a patient said, you know, I went to this place for PT. You guys should maybe consider having a relationship with them. It wasn't like we sought out the people that refer to us. And the other, other part of it is too, I think that no matter how much people talk about business and technology and how impersonal it is and metrics, business is still very personal. Um, and like even the refer, people that refer to us, we also refer out to other people all the time. And the people that we refer to like are people that fill a, a skill gap that we don't have. So like we need orthopedists, we need neurologists, we need pelvic floor physical therapists, we need pediatric specialists because even though we kind of consider ourselves generalists that are focused on sports. There are certain things that, you know, if it's too specialized, that patient probably belongs in a different office. And so because we want to help our patients, we have authentic relationships with people that ended up referring to us. But my intent when I refer a patient to somebody is not that it be reciprocated. It's that I want to help patients. And, you know, like the three of us, we all spend time, you know, our personal time that's not being monetized, talking to our, these other uh, referral sources and healthcare providers to, you know, to give histories. And you, you'll see that when you're in the field, there are certain people that are more receptive to that than others. And most of the people that refer to us and that we refer to are the ones that we can speak candidly with about a patient. I, I, can, I can text them, I can call them, and I don't need to call a receptionist and get put on hold 10 times and play phone tag because communication is so important when it comes to patient care. And if there are a lot of barriers to communication, then those referral networks and they work both ways aren't that authentic. So I think you need to have authentic relationships and just be a competent provider that cares about patients. And I know that sounds really simplistic, but it's one of those things where it's simple, but it's not easy. And I think that is like, that's the first place I would start. And then you can get into things like uh, marketing and talking about scaling, but you can't scale a business until you get to the point that people actually want to see you. And so we, um, as far as our business model and I'm not saying that this is good or bad. I'm just telling you what we did. We kind of started out where we had a certain way that we thought would be the most effective from a, a patient care standpoint. And that was treating one person an hour and not being limited by insurance reimbursements and um, billing codes and, you know, I mean, being under a lot of uh, time pressure because one of those things, you know, no matter how good you are, if you have to treat six patients an hour, it's hard to, um, to actualize your, your skill set. And some people have to do that out of necessity. And admittedly, because we treat one person an hour, we're primarily seeing people out of pocket or people who have out of network insurance policies that tend to reimburse better than in-network policies. And that does limit the population that we can see. Um, but kind of our thought process was at the, at the end of the day, I wanna feel like I provided the best possible care that I could without a lot of the external constraints. And th this model allows us to do that. That said, we do pro bono work, we do discount people, and we also have a lot of free resources like our, we have like a YouTube channel and instructional videos. So there are ways that we try to make ourselves accessible to people that might not be able to afford us in a strict sense, you know, based on our hourly rate. We do make concessions and that's kind of, you know, we, we, we talk to people to see if they're, they're a good fit. And I also have um, relationships with, uh, with in-network providers that I think do, do a very good job you know, with some of those constraints, because there's, there's a range of models within the in-network system. There's, there's clinics that treat six people an hour, there's clinics that treat two. And you, I, in my opinion, you could do a much better job at two people an hour than six. So I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just saying this is what we did and, and why we did it. And I think that ultimately, it's not that what we're doing is better. I think that people should have choices. And I think the more choices people have, the better. Um, because even with people that might be considered more affluent, you know, we value their time and money. So we're not outside of like a post-operative situation, seeing people three days a week for six weeks, which tends to be what in-network uh, facilities do because, you know, if we're being realistic, if an in-network facility knows that they're going to be authorized 18 visits for a particular diagnosis, um, there's generally very little incentive to discharge somebody before that. So we know because, you know, a lot of times people are paying out of their own pocket, we're like, all right, like how do we get them, these people what they need in as short a time as possible? And that, that, that has forced us to create a YouTube channel, create instructional videos, because we kind of look at it like when they're, when they're in person, what do they really need from us 
that we can't provide technologically or remotely. Um, and that's set us up a little bit for success as far as the telehealth thing now, which is a big initiative. You know, I, I got into this field because I like working with people in person. And if I wanted to work behind a computer all day, I would be in a different job. That said, I recognize, especially now, the importance of telehealth. And I think that it's going to play, play, a, pig, play a bigger role in all medical care going forward. But I don't know if I would be satisfied as you know, professionally and personally if all I did was treat people over Zoom. That said, I think that you know, remote uh, consults can be a, a better value. And if you have the technology and the expertise to facilitate that type of communication, then telehealth can work well. And it also makes you accessible to people that might not be able to see you based on geography or pandemic threats. So I think our kind of um, outlook is we want to be able to keep doing in person, but also provide um, provide choices for people that aren't comfortable seeing us in person or, or can't for whatever reason. So that's probably as much as I want to touch on from the business standpoint, unless people have more questions later. The bigger things that I want to kind of talk about now are just commonly what people refer to as clinical reasoning um, and just the thought process. I am not the arbiter of clinical reasoning. Again, this is just kind of what we do. And I just believe in being transparent. And ultimately, I think that as students and as like new clinicians, you should just be exposing yourselves to as many different ideas as possible. And you'll, you'll see patterns that emerge. And you'll see things that you agree with and disagree with. But like you all should be the arbiter of what you think is useful and not useful. Um, I am not that arbiter. But one of the, the questions that, keep, that kept coming up um, as far as like things that you all wanted us to discuss was the theme of, of integration and like and how we learn. So, and this is one of the, just the fundamental dilemmas and it's a timeless dilemma. I don't think it'll ever be quote unquote resolved in education is if we're looking at a, a complex process like patient treatment, right? How do you learn that complex process where the whole is more than the sum of the parts without just teaching in a reductionist way breaking things down into components and just teaching the parts. I kind of liken it to a sport. If you look at a sport, pick any sport you want. Let's say like basketball, right? Like one could make the argument that the best way to become a better basketball player is just to play five on fives and scrimmage and play in games all the time. But the problem with that is, yes, that is the most realistic to what you're going to be doing in a competitive setting, which in this case, the competitive setting is the clinical setting. But if all you ever did was just play five on five and scrimmage, you wouldn't get enough time in the individual aspects of basketball to, to really develop the skills that are needed to that comprise the whole. So, you know, that's why you look at what most sports teams do. Like, yes, they scrimmage, but they also, they work on their offense and their defense as a team. They work on their like individual skills, shooting, dribbling. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's a, a post player, they work on their, their post play and you can't, it's hard to develop individual skills if all you're doing is the whole task. So part whole learning is a timeless dilemma in education. And I think that ultimately you need a little bit of both, right? If all you're, you can't just play the game, but if all you did was just practice shooting without a defender, that's only going to carry over so much into shooting in a game when somebody's guarding you, right? And so in, in education, you know, the analogy is, we learn through, through models and through buckets and through compartmentalization. So in PT school, for example, right, like things are broken down into ortho and neuro and peds and cardio palm. But, you know, and the reality is in, in actual patient care, everybody has a heart. Everybody has a nervous system. Everybody has bones and joints. Everybody started out as a kid and became an adult. And every adult eventually becomes older or geriatric right so we like to fit people into little buckets and that you know there needs to be some of that there needs to be categorization right because like there are certain conditions that are so specialized that if you have this generalist mindset if you're not encountering these very specialized conditions or patient populations frequently it's hard to really develop clinical expertise and and to develop comfort level with those those patients but you know like I'm gonna show, show everybody in a little bit videos of working with one of my favorite patients, if you will, my father. And at the time of the video, he was 78 years old. So we could say, oh, well, he belongs in the geriatric bucket. But he was also quite active and he was doing athletic things. So does that make him a sports patient? 
On top of that, he had some cognitive impairment. Does that make him a, a neuro patient? And then he had some, you know, an orthopedic history where he'd had some orthopedic procedures. He had uh, spinal stenosis with some uh, nerve root compression. So does that make him a, a, neuro, a neurological patient? So again, it's hard to, it's hard to fit people into these, these buckets. And that's why, you know, you need to learn all these, these models and these, these subset ways of treating people, but just recognize that there's a saying, you know, all models are, are useful or are wrong, but some are useful. As long as we don't get too emotionally attached to any model or way of looking at things, I think all of these, think of them as lenses, all these lenses through which to look at people have some merit, but if we take them literally, then we're going to get in trouble. I think it's the same thing with, um, you know, not just with patient populations, but with things like manual, like manual therapy and um, pain science, if you all are familiar with that, like typically, you know, for a lot of the history of the profession, the biomechanical model of pain prevailed where it was like, well, you hurt because your posture is wrong or because you have this MRI or, you know, orthopedic finding. And we kind of know now that, um, you know, biomechanics and posture and orthopedic pathology isn't always destiny. We know that, right, if you get in a car accident and break your femur, it's not surprising that your leg would hurt, but it becomes much more ambiguous when we talk about like back pain and we see that there are a lot of people walking around with disc herniations that are asymptomatic. Um, and then you have like the pain science model, which says that, you know, like really focuses more on the psychosocial aspect of things. It doesn't neglect the bio, but it's like, you know, well, things like back pain are more driven by um, emotions and cultural factors. I think those things are all true. I think that you can take the, the pain science model too far where you can neglect biology. And I mean, I've had, you know, I've seen patients where they came in with, with foot drop motor weakness, sensory um, alterations. And they were told that, you know, like their back pain was kind of in their head and that it wasn't real. And I'm kind of like, you need to go see a neurologist right now because you, you can't, you know, actively dorsiflex your foot. Um, so they, that, that was very much a bio component, but they'd been told that, you know, that to focus more on like the psychosocial and emotional aspect of things. So no matter what, pain is an emotional experience, but it's also, you know, um, a biological experience and an orthopedic experience, all of those experiences at once. The, the fun part about being a clinician is figuring out what's important. Same thing with something like manual therapy. Manual therapy tended to be driven by the, the biomechanical model where it was like, well, this is tight, this needs to be lengthened or shortened. And now we know that manual therapy tends to work more by a, a neurophysiological mechanism, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if, let's say you have shoulder pain and someone sticks their fingers in your subscapularis and the shoulder feels better. The original explanation for that was, well, we're, you know, we're altering uh, the histological properties of the tissue, we're breaking up scar tissue, we're, we're changing anatomy with our hands. But if you really think about it, right, like it wouldn't be good if you could stick your fingers in someone's armpit for 10 seconds and all of a sudden they have these very acute and rapid histological changes. It should be hard to make a, a tissue adaptation, it should require a lot of load, a lot of force, and a lot of duration because, I mean, if we adapted that quickly, then every time we went outside in cold weather, we'd grow fur and become bears, right? And then when we went back inside, we'd shed our fur. Like, so the body can only adapt so fast, and the, most, the quickest way to adapt in the body is through the nervous system. Um, so we know now that, that you know, manual therapy works more via that neurophysiological mechanism that said, some people will say, well, that proves that manual therapy doesn't work, isn't good or useful. If manual therapy achieves whatever it is that your the desired outcome is, if it's pain relief, it's an increased range of motion, it doesn't matter how it worked. Have your own outcome measures to determine what you think success is. Just realize there's different explanations for a lot of these things. And sometimes I think we can overly fixate on the explanations because the truth of the matter is we really don't know how manual therapy exactly works. We probably never will. We can keep refining the explanation, but if we get so caught up in the theoretical explanation, then you know we can we can almost be nihilist. Where we just pick everything apart and don't believe in anything. So I think that we need enough theory to know that we're being we're being safe. You know, we need to do research to determine that what we're doing um, can be uh, is reproducible and not just something that you know is like a transient phenomenon. Um, but there's just a lot of a lot of gray when it comes to this stuff. Whether it's compartmentalizing patients into specific categories or buckets, whether it's theor theoretical explanations. So I think that it's, it's important. Like I, I don't, 
necessarily know if um, a superior way to learn would be to discard these categories and just be like, okay, we're going to treat everyone exactly the same and not categorize them. But part of another like kind of timeless debate in education is how much context do people need to learn, right? So if we're talking about patient treatment, what should we do first? Should we go to the classroom and learn the theory first, or should we go into the clinic, maybe watch somebody for six months or a year, and then go into the classroom? And now when you learn anatomy, then anatomy is going to have context. So anytime you learn something devoid of the context in which that information is applied, it's much harder to learn, right? Because you know, we all we've all studied for tests in school, and part of the reason why it's so hard to learn is because you're learning something for a test. You're not, you're, lear you're not learning it because you think that it's meaningful because you don't actually know why it's meaningful. You're being told that it's important, but you don't have the context to really know why. You know, now that I am out of, and this is not a criticism of school because again, like school can only do so much for you. Like we all have to learn on our own and kind of pursue our own educational resources and, and avenues. But ever since I've graduated, you know, formal academic programs, any like learning that I did wasn't, it was effortless in that I wanted to know something. And because there was context, because there was kind of an emotional need and there was emotional reinforcement via these interactions with people in the clinic, I never like had to study for anything to learn. I just kind of learned it. Like think about how you learn a language. When we, when we learn a second language in middle school or high school, we break things down, we conjugate verbs, we learn alphabets. But when we learned, you know, I'm assuming most people here, English was their first language, if not, you know, there, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but whatever your first language was, you didn't like learn it in a formal sense. You learned it through, through mimicry and just through total immersion, right? Like you were around people who spoke that language and you learned to communicate. And so I don't, I don't, it's obviously not safe and you need some regulation when it comes to education. You need standards. You can't just throw people in a clinic and be like, learn. But as you will all see, if you haven't done it already, how we really retain the information that we're taught in the classroom is by being in the clinic and doing these, these clinical rotations. So I think in medicine, no matter what anybody says, and this is my opinion, the apprenticeship model of learning still reigns supreme. We could even look at how physicians learn. The way that physicians learn, they go to medical school. Medical school is a rite of passage, much like PT school is, where you learn a bunch of stuff, you often don't know the context of it, you memorize stuff for a test, you forget a lot of it, and you move on to the next thing. And it's, again, it's kind of like, in some ways, a rite of passage and an initiation. Um, but if you look at, if you ask any surgeon, where did you learn the most? They're not going to remember the Krebs cycle from medical school. They're going to remember, well, during the first year of my residency, I wasn't allowed to touch a patient, but I watched, you know, a thousand ACL reconstructions. And then the second year, I didn't do the reconstruction, but I might have done the suturing, you know. And then the third year, now they're doing the reconstruction itself, but they're being supervised. And then after that, they're on their own. So the apprenticeship model still works very, very well. That said, we can't just throw people into that. We need to have some theory, some standardization, some regulation, and some structure. Because um, the apprenticeship model, right, that's very hard to standardize because it's so contingent upon who you're apprenticing under. So these are all just timeless dilemmas. And, and, and I think that we're going through this right now socially, right? Um, most really important policy discussions come down to this discussion between rigidity and chaos. And, you know, it, formal, if we're looking at like learning, just learning in the classroom and learning theory, if you take that to the extreme, that's rigidity because you don't know how it applies in the real world. But if all you do is just try to learn the real world without kind of slowing things down, breaking, thing up and, breaking things up into components, that's the epitome of chaos. So it's kind of like, you know, I'm using these examples to kind of drive the point home. Something like border security, I use this example. A sound border, border policy is not to create a wall and not let anybody in, and it's not to just have an open border and let anybody in who wants to come in with no vetting process. Neither of those are really desirable solutions, public policy-wise, just like if we're talking about civil liberties, right? Like, we all want security. We want to feel safe from people who wish to do us harm. But if we take security to its extreme or its nth degree, now we lose our individual autonomy, our civil rights are compromised. These are timeless dilemmas. You could read about these things in Shakespeare, you could read about them in Dickens, and we're going through it right now. And that's just like, no matter how much we have technology and no matter how much things change, they also stay the same. And so that kind of ties into the next theme, right? Which is that like, no matter how, our, no matter how much our patients are different, 
they're also the same and they're human beings. So if we're talking about like clinical reasoning and what the thought process should be, it can be very overwhelming in school because you learn, okay, this is a neuro patient, it's cardiopalm. And then you get into, when you get into orthopedics, it's like, well, this person had an ACL reconstruction, this person had a rotator cuff repair, and you learn protocols for these procedures. And I remember just being so overwhelmed with these protocols because I'm like, everyone's so different. Like this person has knee pain, but one's a meniscus and one's an ACL and one's patellofemoral pain. How do we, how do we keep track of this? And part of that confusion was driven by the, our, the way that we diagnose as a field. Because in my opinion, and I think this is changing a little bit, the way that we diagnose as a field is antiquated, especially in orthopedics where it's like, okay, you have, you have this anatomical diagnosis. In my opinion, if, if you're treating somebody for like a labral tear in their shoulder, then, and the labral tear is the, the actual pain generator or limiter of function, that patient is in the wrong office because as PTs, we can't do anything to repair somebody's labrum. But what we can do is if someone has a labrum or shoulder pain or an ACL surgery or a meniscus surgery, we can look at pain or we can look at a surgery or a procedure as these things provide constraints. So for you know coming off a of surgery, the initial constraint might be, hey, we have to respect tissue healing. Don't move the joint passively beyond this range of motion and no active range of motion for four weeks or whatever. That's a constraint. But beyond that, everyone's exactly the same. Everybody that we see, like fundamentally, I think our profession is about how do we maximize function in accordance with somebody's goals, their personal goals, their cultural and personal values, and then what are their you know, biological constraints? So if it's somebody who's you know, coming off of a, a neurological injury or a stroke, people who are coming off strokes have to function. They have to be able to they will ideally get out of their chair, cross the street. So when someone's coming off a stroke, whatever neurological deficit they have is a constraint to achieving that function. And initially you try to just maximize whatever function is available. You try to restore whatever function was lost by, you know, for example, forcing somebody to use the impaired side. And then there becomes a crossroads where it's like, okay, maybe this person might not recover neurologically. Now we have to teach them a compensatory strategy. So now you have a new, um, a new constraint. But when you start to look at things as people aren't different, everyone's the same, but they have different constraints, it makes this whole thing a lot easier. And that's why like, it takes reps treating patients to get that, that context, because it's, just, it's really hard to get when you're only learning these things uh, in a theoretical environment, right? Um, but so like now I'm working with somebody who dove into a pool, had a, a cervical spine injury, had some neurological insults. Now I wouldn't feel comfortable treating that somebody the day after the, you know, the, the injury, because that's not like, I don't specialize in you know, acute care neuro, but this person's recovered enough neurologically that like, now I just treat him kind of like an athlete. He has athletic goals and we just use his neurological impairments as a constraint. And so for example, like right now, like he has a hard time gripping. So we have to use a hook to get him to if I want to have him deadlift, we have to use a hook to get him to load his lower body so we can, you know, get an adaptation uh, strength-wise and neurologically in his lower body. But we just look at everything as, as a constraint. So I think it'll be easier to kind of um, see how this stuff works in practice if I show some videos. So like I mentioned, I, I, I'm going to use my father as an example. And when he was um, able to, you know, kind of consent to this, he used to like being put on Instagram and he'd always ask like, hey, can you put me on social media so I don't feel bad sharing? I, I had his consent when he was uh, able to offer it. So I'll just show you all, you know, kind of what I did with him. And you'll see it's really just using his orthopedic pathology, um, his neurological pathology, his cognitive pathology. These are all just constraints. And it's like, how do we maximize this individual's function without basically causing any harm? And the constraints are important because the constraints allow you to like these are the things that if you don't abide by these constraints, you can harm the person. Otherwise, everything else is, is fair game in my opinion. And again, it comes down to the person's goals, um, you know, personally and, and, and culturally and ethically and that kind of thing. But so here's my dad at 78 years old um, with, you know, and if you labeled him as any of these things, you would say, well, he shouldn't be doing these things, but we did them and it was safe. And in my opinion, especially as people age, the way to maintain dignity, because 
this is probably another conversation I'd like to have with you all because like when I learned about Alzheimer's and dementia in PT school, again, I had no context. I didn't interact with a lot of elderly people. I, I work with mostly with young, healthy athletes and I was in the military before PT school. So I didn't like aging to me wasn't something that was, it was abstract. It wasn't like a, a, a real thing. Um, and I've learned so much through my own like personal experience with my father. Um, but you can typecast these people and you can, you can almost like baby them in a way where you say, well, this person shouldn't be able to do something. Um, but I think that there's so many things about medicine we don't understand. And going through this experience with my father, like we go to neurologists and they're all well-intentioned and he's on all these medications. But if we're talking about like evidence-based practice, there's very little evidence that these medications do anything. And the reality is like, we're probably not going to find a, a medication that totally reverses Alzheimer's or dementia. Like no matter how much we hate to face the reality, and it's I think a cultural thing in this country, like we're all going to die, we're all going to get old, and we're all probably going to suffer a little bit when we're older. And we should obviously do things to mitigate that. But the one like universally accepted thing is exercise for the most part is good for almost anybody. And movement is good for almost anybody. And as soon as you stop moving, like a lot of bad things start to happen. And that, that to me is what makes our profession so special is that like, we're the only profession that really focuses on that. And it's like undeniably good for pretty much everybody, okay? So here's something, again, 78 years old, working on just kind of a, um, like a lateral movement or a lateral shuffle using the box. So we could call this weight shifting, we could call this changing levels, whatever buzzwords he's kind of showing off there. But, um, and I'll show you all like later how we would scale this for someone who's a little bit more athletic. But I felt safe doing this and we talk a lot about like fall prevention and, and things like that. The reality is like people are going to fall no matter what I fall. We want to make the cost of that, of the falling less consequential. And we have to load people to do that. You can't develop the adaptations to make falling less consequential. If all you do is just stand on one leg with your eyes closed and hope you don't fall because real life is not predictable. Like you're going, you're, you're going to ha have your balance disturbed when you don't expect it. If you, if you don't do dynamic training, all the static balance training in the world is not necessarily going to help you. Um, so here's my father sprinting with a sled. We used, and some of the, sometimes these, this is pretty slow, okay, the Google Drive, but so we're using the sled, right? Because it provides it provide some balance. We're using a little bit of load. The load actually in this case makes it safer because it slows them down. And so this is sprinting or this is power training for somebody with my father's constraints, okay? Um, but we're trying to be as aggressive as possible without hurting somebody. I'm there guarding, but I felt safe with this setup that nothing, you know, that he wasn't a fall risk. Um, here is working on kind of upper body, upper body power, if you want to call it that. Like this would be the upper body plyometric for somebody who's a little bit older. So don't, don't let your face hit the wall. We're obviously scaling this by having them basically vertical. If we wanted to make this harder, we would do like a regular push-up, and we would make it much more explosive. But again, for him, and you could even call this rotator cuff training, right? We're learning how to decelerate the shoulder. Whatever bucket you want to put it in, we're doing a lot of things. A lot of times, it becomes semantical. Okay, I wouldn't have a 78-year-old jump onto a 50-inch box like you see on the internet, you know, with with younger athletes. But for my father, this was appropriate. Okay, we're learning how to express force quickly and dynamically. I'm not having him jump up and down. He's jumping up, stepping down. This was the limit of what I felt comfortable with from a safety standpoint. But if we don't do these things, then people are going to deteriorate quickly. And, you know, that elasticity is one of the things that diminishes the most as we age. And if we don't train it, I'm not saying we're going to reverse this stuff, but if we don't train it, it's going to be diminished a lot quicker. And this is like, I think, the humane thing that we do is we try to preserve these qualities. Um, here is we're doing a squat variation, a front-loaded squat. With a higher level athlete, I would just do this with a lot more weight. And somebody who had better hip range of motion, less arthritis, would be able to get to a better depth. But you could even call this loaded mobility training. He's using whatever available range of motion is, is there in his hips. He's loading it. So we're getting strength. We're getting mobility. We're getting ankle dorsiflexion. We're getting knee flexion, extension, right? And now I'm having him work on some you know, lateral movement dynamic balance, weight shifting. He's going side to side. So we created this, this medley here. Guarding, kind of lost his balance there. So keeping it safe. But if we, if we underload people, whether it's an athlete or an elderly person, 
we're not doing them any favors. We're not setting them up, up for success when it comes to their functional goals. Um, here's, this is pretty, in my opinion, badass for a 78 year old, just trying to work on some, uh, some hip extension and, and hamstring strength. You, if some of you have heard of like um, the Nordic hamstring exercise, here's a regression of that. And these were taken, you know, two years ago when cognitively my father was much more able to like follow instructions. Now, even though I think he's physically capable of doing some of this stuff, just, I, I wouldn't be able to communicate it as effectively. So that's why like even everything has a place, like even machines that are kind of demonized because they're considered non-functional. Like if you have somebody who has got major cognitive impairment, if you put them in a machine that only moves one way, now you can load that person in a safe way without that, that cognitive um, challenge because when you work with, with this population, you'll realize that like whatever you did a minute ago, they're going to forget the next set after they rested. And with a machine, it's just much easier to, to make the intent clear of what you want done. Okay. Here's uh, a higher step up working on, you know, that, that hip extension strength, knee extension strength, even uh, hip range of motion. Because for my father, this is probably like the limit of what his hip flexion would be actively. Um, working on some explosive throws here, have them in tall kneeling just for the, um, just to kind of train some, some postural things. And this stuff is fun, you know, like it's fun to slam a medicine ball to the ground as hard as you can. So things like sleds and medicine balls that have a low learning curve that are mainly concentric, don't cause a lot of, um, you know, eccentric stress and soreness. Great for a lot of populations, especially elderly, in my opinion. And, you know, lastly, you know, for just some, um, some abdominal training, you could call it scapular stability training, whatever you want to call it. Just working on a bare position, working on getting long through the arms, maintaining some roundness in the upper back. It's kind of an anti-extension exercise, which somebody with stenosis, you know, their problems, their symptoms are typically exacerbated by, you know, end range extension. So we're trying to get them out of that. And you know, re reduce some symptoms and also just build some function at the same time. So that's what I would do with my, uh, with my father. And now I'll show you how we scale that stuff for, you know, higher level athletes. So here's, we just saw the bear. Here's like when I train myself, how I do the bear. Now I've got, you know, opposite arm, opposite leg up in the air. I'm working on some hip extension. It's a way to make that much more challenging. Okay. But it's, it's the same, it's a continuum of the same thing. Um, we're talking about like, you know, the, the lateral movement, right? Here's just a lateral jump. This is when I was quarantined, jumping over some paper towels because equipment was limited, trying to stick the landing. So working on balance, working on stability, working on force production, you know, at the velocity end of the spectrum, all these things. Every exercise, every category is, is scalable progression from the exercise I showed my dad doing. Here's kind of the Nordic hamstring exercise. Now we're working with longer levers, so it's more challenging, more range of motion. Um, taking that step up, okay? And now making it more dynamic. It's like being on a bouncy castle as a kid. These are a lot of fun. We would do this for the higher level athlete. And even this can be scaled by making the box lower. Okay, so I've done stuff like this with my father but on maybe like a three inch box. Um, let's see what we have here. Okay, so taking like a, uh, like, like a push up or a push up fall. Now we're doing, you know, we're using rings, which are a little less stable, making like a handstand type push up in a pike position, challenge the, the leverage. So here's an upper body progression of a push up. Some of the dynamic stuff we're gonna show is a lot of fun. Um, so here's Trevor. He's typically, you know, we, we always take people that are the best at certain things and show them on Instagram. So Trevor's our change of direction and an agility guy, okay? So taking some of like the weight shifting and lateral movement that I have my father do, now here's how we would train like a professional athlete in a return to play scenario. We're gonna accelerating laterally, stopping, deceleration. Okay, we're not gonna do that obviously three weeks after an ACL surgery, but that's what NRAGE ACL rehab should look like. If you can't do that, 
you shouldn't be playing sports. Um, more just, you can call this strength and conditioning, you can call it rehab, it doesn't really matter because if someone's goal is to be explosive on, you know, in a team sport, in the field of play, these are the kind of things, in our opinion, people should be doing. So working on deceleration here, you can call it dynamic balance, you can call it whatever you want. Um, you're seeing similar themes. So Doug, that's actually a, a nice a tie into Jeff's question. He wrote okay. in the chat, he wrote in the chat box, um, once you progress into the later stages of a patient's rehab and you're working on activity sports specific goals, what differentiates um, the physical therapist from the strength and conditioning specialist? That's, that's a great question. Let me show the rest of these videos and I'll, I'll answer that. So um, now this is more linear, right? You kind of get the idea. We'll just show a couple more just so you guys can kind of get, get the picture of it. So that's, that's he, Trevor's initiating that lateral movement with a hip turn. That's working on hip trunk dissociation, which is kind of like the, the mainstay of athleticism in most sports and change of direction, learning how to dissociate your hips from your torso. Okay. Now I had my dad push the sled. We have, you know, uh, athletes, younger, healthier athletes, they have to sprint at maximal velocity. Everybody talks about like, hamstring pulls, if, if you're not sprinting at maximal velocity in training, you know, you're, it's, it makes sense that you're more likely to pull a hamstring in a game if you're not used to running at that velocity. So this is just, it's stress inoculation. We need to run at maximal velocities to get the hamstrings to adapt. And then lastly, you know, an upper body progression of like a, like I had my father doing like a row. I don't know if I show that video, but so here's kind of like, you can call it end stage shoulder rehab. Here's kind of like an advanced pulling type exercise. It's basically kind of like um, inspired by the gymnastics, the front lever, combining that with the pull up. So you see how all this stuff is, is scalable. So I, I'll answer that first question. Then I want to open up, uh, let, let Greg and Trevor chime in because I'm sure they're going to have some things that they would like to share as well. So as far as, um, how do we differentiate between when someone should be with a PT or a strength and conditioning coach? I, I, the, the, fir, the easiest way to answer that is you, you, have, you have to obviously respect scope of practice. So in my opinion, and like a strength and conditioning coach shouldn't be doing, you know, post-op rehab day one, but after three months, there's a lot of strength coaches that could probably more competently rehabilitate an athlete than some PTs. So you have to respect scope of practice and make sure you're not violating any laws and your practice act. But then beyond that, it really comes down to knowledge. Like if, if as a physical therapist, you know that you're working with like a high school athlete, let's say, and that athlete has to change direction on the field. If you don't understand change of direction to adequately and ethically prepare that athlete for sport, you either need to learn that, learn change of direction stuff or refer out to somebody who does because and there's a lot of you know, pressure to get people discharged. A lot is driven by insurance. If we're just getting people range of motion back, getting them like you know, five out of five MMT in their quad, and then saying, okay, you're done. You're, you can go play football now. That's, like, that's a big leap of faith. And it, you can get away with that sometimes, but it, I don't think luck is a good strategy. So I think you know, there's a lot of overlap between professions. And a lot of this stuff is very political. Like I'll, you know, I get, like to be fair, you know, and you, you, you'll, you will all see in school, like there's going to be physicians that don't like physical therapists having direct access because frankly, they're going to say it's unsafe. It's a threat to their market share because we all have overlapping skill sets and, you know, having physical therapists as direct access providers, um, you know, now if someone's non-surgical and they see a PT first instead of an orthopedist, that's tapping into a pretty lucrative uh, market. But to be fair, you know, I get I get emails from, you know, the New York state board saying like athletic trainers want to have more autonomy, sign this petition to block that. So everyone's like kind of trying to crap on everybody else. Personally, as a consumer of healthcare, I like people to have choice as long as things are safe. I think that a lot of times safety is brought up kind of to fear monger and to um, suppress conversation. And it's really not about the patient. It's about, we want to protect our market share. So we say somebody else is unsafe. Um, I think that 
the safety thing is it's a reality, but it's also overblown. So when it comes to these these things, like wh whoever whoever is competent should be working with the person, um, and then you know respecting scope of practice. So anything that like Greg or Trevor, because I've talked enough, and then I want to open up to questions. Anything Greg or Trevor that you guys want to add on like any of those themes or even the, the last question, and I'll shut up now. You kind of hit it on the head. It's really about knowledge and where you actually come from. Like, for ourselves here at this practice in Jersey, like, the a ton of high school, junior high, college, and pro athletes. And, you know, like, Greg has, Greg has more knowledge, is more comfortable with, like, so it's like, I don't know, like, we're kind of But it's that as, as Greg has, whereas I get a lot of the change of direction of the course where I Sorry. Is anyone, is anyone else? Yeah, Trevor, you're breaking yeah, up he's, big he's time. Up. I think it's your microphone or headphone. Yeah, just go computer audio, microphone. And then I didn't really hear much from the beginning. I don't know if anyone else did, but yeah, I would just say just restart it. I would say do it over, Trevor. Tre Trevor, uh, you came in kind of muffled, so can you just repeat what you said without your headphones? I think he's trying to. Okay. He's trying to figure out the tech part of it. Um, Trevor, can you hear us? <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, what I believe Trevor was saying, hi, I'm Greg. What I believe Trevor was, was talking about, he was referring to um, just how we, we might have some subspecialties, right, as physical therapists. So I myself played a lot of baseball. I worked in baseball. So there's a lot of context around working with the baseball athlete that I might understand that Trevor doesn't because he didn't play baseball. He played football. So then there's that sort of same thing with him. If I, if I don't have the, the context around a position that a, that a football player might play because I didn't play it or I'm not as educated in, in football as it is, then it's something that he has more context to, to go off of and he can maybe prepare that person better for, for their sport and their, in re, uh, in their end stage rehab. Um, so that just goes back to exactly what Doug was saying, um, where it's really just expertise. And the more you can expose yourself to various experts in various specialties within, you know, if we're talking sports and ortho, um, that's the best way you can learn from everybody. So for an example, uh, Trevor, Doug, and myself, we all went and we had Trevor work with a running coach and all of us were there and we said, okay, coach the, coach Trevor, let's see what you do. And that's, so in, our, in our opinion, I think the best way to see what other professionals are doing, other clinicians are doing, is by letting them do what they do best and, and asking questions to them while they're doing it or, or maybe afterwards if that's you know, more appropriate for the setting. Um, so that's just one example of how we, we look for expertise from those who have it um, in, uh, in certain areas that we don't necessarily have. So I don't know that there's you know, too much of a distinction. There's a large gray area between when does rehab and physical therapy finish and when does sports performance and strength and conditioning start. Um, and it's, it, the, the real answer is the more you know, the better, because um, then you can help prepare that person for a longer period of time. Um, but you should also know your, your limitations and have a network of people who you can refer out to, like that running coach, for example, who maybe we would refer out to if we needed that. But now we, that we've exposed ourselves to that, to that you know, specialty and we've learned and poured over running information, now we feel like we are able to, to, pr to prepare a runner, whether it's a sprinter or long distance runner, um, that maybe we now don't need to refer out unless it's maybe more of a programming thing or an elite athlete where uh, it's like, okay, I'm not a powerlifting coach. So I'm going to have you work with a powerlifting coach because I'm not that. Um, and that's just a little bit different. Um, and that's just sort of taking it a step further. Like I'm not going to be a, a tennis uh, instructor because, you know, I can hold a racket and swing it. I need somebody who knows exactly what they're doing with the technique in the sport um, and, you know, the technical and tactical components of the sport. Um, Trevor, you're back. Did you, was there something else you were, can you actually hear me now? Yeah, yes. now I can hear you. Um, yeah, I just think to kind of add on is like knowing where your limitations end. And because I think where, where athletes kind of get mistreated in this is when the PT doesn't take them far enough and the strength coach is trying to start them too far ahead. There is this big gray area in the middle that I think people 
really misjudge about like the time that needs to be spent doing certain activities and certain tasks that will allow them to be more successful once they get back out of the field. Like with Doug's example, it's like just because you can do a 5-10-5 in a closed environment at 50% speed doesn't mean you're ready to go and be, you know, full limitation in practice. There's so many different forces and different stresses that the app it needs tons and tons and reps of um, to have like in whether it's with a physical therapist, if that's their skill set, or whether it's with their strength coach, if that's their skill set that they need to do. So it's just athletes need the exact same thing from the start of the rehab to being back on the field. It's just where do you, how far can you take them? And then where can the strength coach kind of start them? So like Greg said, it, it, it's just having the different skill sets, knowing what your limitations are and then trying to build upon that. Yeah. And I think like a lot of it is just self-awareness <laughs> and being self-reflective. I do want to clarify that like, all three of us are comfortable working with any kind of an athlete where we would refer out amongst each other is if we were working with like an elite athlete, like Trevor and I are comfortable working with a throwing athlete and doing the rehabilitation. But if we had a major league pitcher where like that extra 0.1% is worth millions of dollars, like I know, like I have no hesitation saying that like Greg's more qualified to work with that person than me. I feel comfortable with change of direction athletes. But if I, if I was working with like an NBA player, and Trevor was able to like do their change of direction. Like he's just better at that stuff than me. I'm comfortable with it. So, but I think that we all, we should all feel responsible. Like we, we should know about all these things, but if it's like that really, really unique case where they need to have the quote unquote, like the best thing, that's when we refer out, but we don't use that as an excuse to be like, well, like I don't need to learn, know about running or I don't need to know about throwing. Cause really, I mean, even in a specialized athlete, most of what we're doing with them is still very, very basic. Like we're still trying to get them to, you know, like move, move well, however you want to define that and then add some load speed and capacity to it. Like that's fundamentally what we're doing. It's like, we're trying to get them to access and control range of motion. That's important for health and their sport. We're trying to load that through strength work. We're trying to do it rapidly and dynamically through speed work. And we're trying to add capacity through endurance type training, whatever that looks like for the sport. But we're all comfortable working with all kinds of athletes and populations. We just refer out in the very specialized cases. Let's see. Um, okay, so Iris had the question about the apprenticeship model. Great question. So the question is about, um, do we think specialty fellowships and residencies should be required? So I don't know if they should be required because personally, and this is just kind of my, my bias. I like, I think that when it comes to this stuff, like some regulation is needed. I don't want too much because I want to be able to choose like kind of what I think is important when you mandate that a residency is required. Now, you know, instead of like creating that own educational, I think that like physical therapy school gives you the tools to learn on your own. And at a certain point you can only keep out, you can only, outsource your own learning for so much like it's great to have structure but no matter what like ultimately like you're gonna have to figure out what you need to learn a residency could be a way there um i just you know think that to mandate it could also put people in a difficult position because we all are in different levels of debt and financial hardship when we graduate and now like with a residency like if you do that yes you there will be an educational benefit but there's an opportunity cost in terms of like paying off loans and, and reduced salary and for some people, if now if you require that residency, now you might have people who otherwise maybe would have entered the profession who won't because you're just increasing their financial hardship. That said, it probably would elevate the standard of care in the field. So, you know, it's one of those things where like, I don't know if there's a right answer. I think that, you know, the way that you ask the question, I can answer it definitively. When you say should, I would probably say no. I don't know. I don't think you should in that sense in like a dogmatic way. But I think people should have the choice to do it, certainly. Um, because right now, you know, the difficult part is there's not a lot of like, you don't, you don't increase your earning potential by doing a residency. And it's only really respected within the field, not externally. That's not, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But, you know, there is a cost to doing a residency as well. And it's really up to like the individual, to, in my opinion, to determine whether that is a good investment or not. Um, like I, I'm more of like a self-directed learner and I was, you know, went to PT school when I was 30 years old and graduated when I was 33. So I, I didn't feel like I needed that kind of direction, but if I'd gone to school seven years earlier, I might've wanted it. 
So I don't, that, I don't, I'm not trying to be evasive, but the should thing is what's problematic to me because you know, there's, there's a downside to mandating it, but I do agree that it would elevate the standard of care and it, it would create some, um, you know, some uniformity, but I also like the fact that I cannot be uniform and that's part of like what makes you, your patient seek you out too. So it's, it's again, one of those and, like uh, kind of timeless dilemmas. I don't yeah. know if you guys want to touch on that. Just, just jumping onto that too. Um, something to consider would be maybe figuring out and exposing yourself more to the things that you don't already know um, as a student and then using those points and having that knowledge of your limitations when you're then picking your clinical rotations. Maybe you can find somebody who works primarily with runners if you feel like that's something you A, want to do and you're currently not that great at. Um, and that's a good way to then figure out sort of, you know, what knowledge you need to acquire um, where it's, you're giving yourself a residency through something that's already in place where you can self-select, you know, where your clinicals are. And obviously some programs are different than others where you can, where you can choose to do your clinicals. And, and, uh, I know we were fortunate where Columbia helped us set up some clinicals with people in, in maybe some specialty, um, you know, markets and, and with some specialty populations where we benefited greatly from it. And I think it's definitely, uh, contributed to, our uh, quote unquote success um, as clinicians now. I think what the residency offers, you know, <clears throat> more than anything is now, now you're, you're at least like signing up to have a mentor or mentors. Right. Now the, you're, you're, you're paying accountability, for right? It's accountability. You can do that informally. It's just harder. Oh yeah. But you know, I think for a lot of people, residency is a great fit and I, I'm glad that I think the profession's better off that it's available to people. Um, and you know, I, I, we do a podcast. I want to interview people who have gone through some of these residencies because I hear about what they're learning and like, it's awesome. There's also a lot of redundancy. A lot of it is a repeat of what you've already learned. Right. So, you know, again, it's such an individual decision, but the should thing is where it's kind of like, well, I don't know if it should, because now everybody has to do it, but it might make the profession more respected too, because it, like it is political and, safety and efficacy is not, you know, it's like, there's no way to like say, okay, look at all individuals and say, this person's safe and knowledgeable. What do medical people do when they get political? They say, well, I have X number of years of education and this profession has Y, right? So now if you say, well, PTs have five years of postgraduate education, now it like gives them some bragging rights, but you're also capitulating to, in my opinion, a flawed way of evaluating um, safety and competence too, if you do that. But you also it is political and when things are political, you have to play the game to a point. Um, I will let Greg, I want, I want you guys to take the next question first and I'll, it's because it's a really, it's a great question and I'll maybe chime in when you guys are done. From Corey. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you come across, oh, Corey, I know Corey. I know that name. Uh, do you come across situations where your athletes, sports specific coaches or strength coaches prescribe things you may not agree with? Oh yes. A lot. Uh, how do you approach this with your athletes? Um, so this, I think, goes way back to something Doug initially touched on was relationships um, over anything else, like whether it's business success, your patient success, uh, communicating with other you know, sport coaches or other professionals is relationships. And no matter what, like that's going to be the most important thing to either A, getting across what you think is best for your patient or understanding better why their other provider or you know, coach or whoever decided to tell them you know, a certain piece of advice or, or coach them a certain way. Because maybe you are wrong. Maybe, maybe there's something that you, d you definitely disagree with, but um, you know, maybe you don't have the depth of knowledge that this, spe you know, this specific sport coach has, where when, they, when you then talk to them, they can communicate it to you in a way that you're like, oh, wow, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. So that's definitely a piece of it. Um, is definitely exposing yourself to other providers, other professionals, and, and the coaches in your community, the, the patients that you're working with. Um, I know I work with a lot of, like you know, we've already touched on, I work with a lot of baseball players, so I hear a lot of different schools of thought from different pitching coaches or hitting coaches, and there are definitely certain biases I have towards the things that I, I like or don't like. Um, but again, like some, somebody might like tell me a patient might tell me one thing, but the coach is actually saying something that doesn't necessarily line up with what that patient is telling you. So it's almost like you're playing telephone a little bit. So definitely like give the benefit of the doubt if it's something that you, you don't completely um, you know, buy into, but definitely have to understand where that message is coming from for the patient 
you know, there could be a certain reason. Because I know there's certain things that I do that potentially, you know, two years ago, I might have scoffed at uh, as a clinician. And maybe I just didn't understand that there's a certain context that this specific patient that's in front of me right now is going to need that thing that I scoffed at. And I don't know until it's in front of me. Um, so I think that's a, a huge thing to consider as well. Communicating to the athlete then, um, you know, I definitely, you try and you, you be as professional as you can. You don't trash anything that someone else is doing because you want this athlete to be on your team. You want to be on their team. Um, if you can, if you shut them down and for some reason they have, you know, their coach is someone who's already in their inner circle and they have an, an extremely deep relationship with, you've already shut yourself out and there's no longer, you know, potentially no longer a way for you to help this patient when you might be the best provider that they have access to. So that's really important that you don't, uh, you know, say something that you're going to regret because, you know, whether or not you believe what, what they're doing or not um, is the right thing. So Trevor, Doug, yeah, go for it. Jump in. Yeah, I think that communication between like the game of telephone that Greg mentioned between like the coach to the athlete to us is often like, especially with like high school and junior high kids, like they can't remember or they don't, you know, understand some of the things that we tell them. And then so if they, it could be the exact same thing where they go back to their coach and maybe the coach and I are on the same page, but the telephone that is the athlete is kind of miscommunicating everything. So I think that's often a big thing and, and not being afraid to like, ask for the coach's number to be able to talk about it because because we always want to learn from somebody else and and i would i love learning from sport coaches because they see way more of whatever that is than we do um when it comes to actually communicating with the athlete i think there's a big you know most of the people that we see don't come to us unless they have some sort of symptom that they're dealing with so oftentimes the way we coach them and what we're giving them is some sort of modification possibly because of the symptoms that they're dealing with so um, like, you know, some of my basketball players where they're, they're, they have hip impingement, their coach is telling them to get deeper, get deeper, get deeper in their defensive stance, but it bothers their hips. So I tell them to just stand up a little bit more. It doesn't impinge their hips and it makes them move a little bit better on the court. Like the coach may be right in the context of what he's seeing, but in the context of what we're seeing, it's very different. So we are coaching an individual where oftentimes sport coaches are coaching groups of athletes, not necessarily an individual. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, like more of the strength coach side of things, like oftentimes like a strength coach, kind of the same thing. They don't have the opportunity to be one-on-one -on -one with an athlete for an hour like we do. So even though they may have given an athlete a great program and made a really good exercise choice, either the athlete could be executing it poorly on their own, which again, like is something that, that we can help the athlete execute that movement better, or there may be some sort of change that needs to be communicated to the coach that we are then in a place to, to communicate to. Like I had an athlete recently who, um, because of the whole COVID situation, hasn't been able to train with his coach in person. So he's just been training on his own and he was feeling terrible physically. And I talked to the coach and we kind of made, and the coach didn't know that because the athlete never told him. So we just made some uh, training modifications and he's felt better since then. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that. Um, you know, like Greg said, you never, never badmouth anybody. There are certain situations where like, you're gonna have to work with other providers, like in, in a team-based care. And there's a lot of situations where like, you know, an athlete might say, well, my sport coach or my strength coach said this, but like, you're never actually going to have to interact with them. And sometimes it doesn't always make sense to like, that's kind of an individual situation. One thing I, I like to give the athletes is choice and even patients, because I have patients who are like, well, you know, my chiropractor said this, my ortho said this, my acupuncturist said, th says this. I never try to like, unless I think it's like truly dangerous, which it often isn't, it's more just difference of opinion. I don't tell people that patients that somebody else is wrong, but I'll say, look, this is what I believe. And I kind of look at it like I work for the patient or the athlete. The burden is on me to demonstrate that like what I'm doing makes sense. Um, did I also, You're good. What I make, what, I, what I'm doing makes sense. And so like you, like you, you should see whoever you want. Like I don't get offended when people get second opinions or want to see other PTs. Cause a lot of times like people, you know, there's a psychological aspect to this and people will come to you because they want to hear a certain thing. And that oftentimes is more important, like actually getting the result they want. So if like they go to you and you don't tell them what they want to hear, they might say, can I go to somebody else? Like, I'm not offended because I want you to get better. I mean, if you go to somebody else and they give you what you want and need, then that's great. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not always going to be the right fit for people. So I like to give people a choice and just say, look, this is what I think. It's your decision. If you want or need me to talk to somebody else you're working with, 
I'm happy to do it. I leave that up to the athlete, but I never say that what, what somebody's doing is like is wrong or, you know, or bad or injurious unless like think it's like a real safety issue. And then on top of that, like sometimes, and I've had this happen, you know, as an ethical matter, if I really don't agree with what somebody else is doing, like on the, the athlete's team, and there's no way to change that, then I'll just say, look, I'd rather not work with you. And sometimes you have to make that decision too. I've had situations where, um, you know, like I've had to do that. And at the end of the day, you have to feel like you're delivering value to that person and doing the best job that you can. And if you think you're constrained by like, whether it's like political circumstances or something that another you know, member of that athlete's team is making you do or something that just won't change. Um, sometimes the best thing to do in the most, like in my opinion, thing with the most integrity is just to say like, you know what, like, I'm sorry, I don't think this is a good fit, but I, I wish you success with whoever else you, you wanna work with. Um, but it's like individual circumstances, you know, always prevail here, but communication is, is the big thing. And I think just being, being transparent because um, you don't have to feel comfortable with everything, but if you don't, you shouldn't be like passive aggressive. You should make that very clear. I think, um, let's see the next one. How important do you think it is for clinicians to have a network of trusted professionals? Well, actually the, the one from Jen first. Um, former athlete, how do you manage relating to an athlete's uh, feelings of well-being and wanting to get back to the sport ASAP without a quick fix? So I think that's really kind of touching on the, um, like the psychological aspect of rehab and return to play. That's one of those things where, again, it's like, fundamentally there's no difference between the physical and the psychological because if you do good rehab whatever that looks like as people progress through their rehab they are going to gain physical confidence which should translate into psychological confidence because for example it's hard, it's really hard unless you're delusional to have psychological confidence if you didn't get your quad strength back after an acl reconstruction um so i think that if the rehab is systematic and it's progressive you know and people meet certain benchmarks and that now when you put them back in the field, it's like, oh, well, like I've already kind of been doing this stuff. Now there are objective criteria and questionnaires. Like I think even, you know, like as it pertains to ACL, they have those. Those are fine. If you want something like a way to quantify that stuff, you can do it. Um, and I, I think it's good because at least, at least you're asking the question like, hey, how am I addressing the mental aspect of rehabilitation? But really if you're doing the right rehab physically, the psychological part, the psychological aspect is necessarily a part of the physical because you're you're challenging people and when they gain that confidence like when they're doing the things that trevor was doing in those videos versus not they're more likely to be confident when they go back into the field so like the the more you can bridge the gap between what their goal is and what the what they do in the field and what you do in the in the rehab setting i think the more confident they're they're going to be I think it's a great answer i think it's just you know like throughout the whole return to play process especially like whether it's you know they rolled their ankle and they're going to get back in a couple of weeks or whether they had an ACL surgery and they're not going to get back for, you know, closer to 12 months. It's really communicating with them the entire time and making sure that they feel comfortable and confident with each step of the process. And they know why we're doing what we're doing. Cause uh, I mean, athletes, athletes want to know what's going on and they want to know, you know, like, well, why, why can't I be back right now? And it's like, well, because you can't do these really simple things before we got to do the harder things. And I think just explaining to them and, and, and have, helping them un understand the entire process from start to finish really goes a long way. Yeah, so kind of making it like criteria driven and not time driven. Because if you say like, anytime someone says, oh, like four weeks, like how do you, how do you really know? It's like, you're ready to play when you're ready to play. And so like, you can spell out communication wise, here are the, benchmarks I want you to, to meet before you go back versus giving an arbitrary timeline. And that, like, you know, from a motivational standpoint, it's like, all right, like now I've got to be able to do these things. People can get complacent when you're like, oh, just in four weeks, you'll be better. Well, okay, then I could, you could just do nothing for four weeks if it's four weeks. It has to be criteria driven. And that can be as like objective or kind of more, um, you know, subjective and eye test as you, as you want. But there should be some kind of a criteria before you progress somebody to the next phase. Okay. How important do you think it is for clinicians to have a network of trusted fitness professionals, trainers, and how often do you find yourself referring to them? So, um, yeah, I mean, it's important, you know, again, because there's overlap between like what we're doing 
and what we would call like fitness training. Like I feel like the three of us could do things that look like fitness training. We've had people that we work with that after they rehab and they're no longer symptomatic, they have stayed on for kind of follow on, you know, training as a different service. Um, it's not something we do a ton of, but when people like really want it, we'll do it. Um, we do have trainers that like we trust to work with our patients. Um, we think are a little bit more like responsible and educated. And so, you know, so, and also like there's different price points, right? Because different trainers charge different things. So if someone's like, Hey, I want to work with the trainer, but here's my price point. Like we have a network where we could say, okay, like we think this person's really good. They're within that, that price range. Um, I think that it's really important to address fitness and whatever their follow on routine is after you discharge them. And it comes down to, do you have the expertise or the desire to do it yourself or do you want to kind of have somebody else do it? I mean, the reality is like most people, it's a pretty high barrier to be able to afford like consistent fitness or, or personal training. So it's a pretty exclusive population. So you, you, I mean, people who want that and can afford it. Yes. I think it's important to have a network, but you should also have solutions for people uh, for whom that's not available. Right. So that's why we have YouTube videos. We'll, we'll write discharge programs for people. We'll say, okay, like your knees, you know, doesn't hurt anymore, but like for the next four to six weeks, do this. And here's the progression and then go back to like doing kind of whatever you want. But, um, we try not to like let people, we don't like discharge people without some kind of a plan, whether that's handing them off to somebody else or giving them the tools that they need to succeed on their own. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, like I, I definitely deal with a lot of other trainers, probably more than Doug and Trevor do, um, because the facility that I work out of pre predominantly or actually only in Chatham, New Jersey, we're inside of a sports performance facility and there are six, uh, I think six sports performance coaches there. I see a lot of the baseball athletes that are in the facility. They come to me for whatever they need. It might be post-op, it might be just, you know, my shoulder hurts, whatever it is. And then I know their coach. I already know their strength coach, so they're in my network. Oftentimes, I'll also get patients who've never been to the facility before who come again after if it's post-op or it's, you know, some sort of, you know, pain that they have. And then I have the trainers in the facility at my disposal to recommend when the time is right, where, you know, it's, you know, uh, based on insurance, based on my ability to give them what they need, the price points, there's a lot of different factors, but um, it's definitely helpful to know that I have trainers that are in the same exact building as me, which I'm, it's, a, it's a huge luxury for me. I know that's not, you know, very common and it's not regular um, for a physical therapist to have that, but it's definitely important to know, okay, when I'm done with this pa patient, and I think about it ahead of time too, like I'm thinking about it, you know, weeks in advance before I'm quote unquote done with this patient, that they'd be a good fit for this trainer or that trainer. Um, so it's definitely something that's important to have. Um, and then uh, we're also getting, we get referrals from these trainers too. They like what we do because we like to, we like to get them back to their training. We don't want to keep them like Doug was describing, you know, three times a week for six weeks because right there that takes up all their training time. And now they're not working with their personal trainer or their, their sports performance coach. So in the cases where they can continue to do that stuff and we can just be a resource for them and see them infrequently, it's, it's huge where we can help a trainer keep their client and then they're going to keep referring back to us because they like what we do and we, we continue to provide value. Yeah, I'd say just as an addition to that, like a lot, especially in, in, uh, in, in New York City, a lot of the referrals we get are from people we know just in the fitness space in general. And they, like Greg just kind of alluded to, it's like they send us their clients because we help them keep training because we, they don't come to us and we're saying like, no, X out all training. We do a pretty good job of coming up with modifications that we know will be safe for the client to be able to do with their coach or, or with their trainer um, to allow them to keep chasing their goals. Because our goal, like Doug said us during some of those videos, it's like movement is good for everybody. So we try to give, keep, keep people moving as much as they can, as safely as they can with as little pain as they can. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much of like the chronic pain stuff you've all learned, but like one of the easiest ways to create a chronic pain patient is to tell them all the things they can't do. Um, and so like, unless someone's really, really debilitated, they can always do something. So you, you have to start with like, all right, what do you like, even with a trainer, like, what do you normally do with your trainer? Okay. I do back squats, but my hip or my lower back hurts. Well, like, okay, let's try a different kind of squat. Did that hurt? No. Okay. Well, I'll talk to your trainer and I'll just have you sw swap out the back squat for a front squat or, you know, a goblet squat. So, um, 
I think that's why trainers like working with us is because we're not like fear mongers. We don't tell people they shouldn't do things because very seldom is complete rest and, you know, lack of activity, lack of activity, a good thing, but you'd be surprised how many medical providers, including some PTs will tell people like, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do this. And it's also, again, the, the, the word should is it's a very, you know, kind of dogmatic thing where it's like, who am I to tell somebody what they should or they shouldn't do? I see plenty of patients like, they do workout classes that I think are like kind of insane and I would never do them myself, but I kind of look at it like, all right, if you'd like to do that, my job is to prepare you for it. It's not to tell you that you shouldn't do it. Um, you know, and, there, and again, there comes a line where it's like, all right, if someone has, you know, foot drop and neurological weakness and back pain, it's like, well, you probably shouldn't be doing this class until this gets better. Like I will draw a hard line sometimes, but my, my values are not my patient's values. Like I start with like, what are your values? What are your constraints and, then, and your goals? And like, how can we get you from point A to point B? I'm not trying to project what I think is fun or useful onto somebody else, unless I think there's a real safety issue. But I think that, again, the safety flag is raised a little bit too quickly and too hastily um, in a lot, of, a lot of cases when if you're creative, you can work around some of those things. I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I know, Doug, you mentioned that you're willing to stay um, a little bit longer to um, yeah, talk to some folks. Yeah, we don't want to hold anybody hostage, but uh, right. I can stay on for a little bit longer beyond 7.30 if people have extra questions. So. Okay, cool. Um, I think the next question is from Nirvana. Uh, I think, well, Trevor, why don't you take that one? I think you have the best story when it comes to kind of just like being all in on the, on the business. So, the question, can you talk a little more, bit more about the business part of starting your own practice? Did you work at other clinics to try to gain ex experience first before starting your own clinic? Uh, the answer is no for all of us. Uh, well, Greg worked a little bit part-time. I, I worked for yeah. six months part-time while we were also doing this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, like for myself, uh, like I come from a family that's owned a business my entire life. So I've known that I was always going to at least like going to start my own business at some point in time. And I was very fortunate enough to meet Greg and Doug in school and we kind of all shared the same vision the same passion um, but yeah I mean we went all in I was living off of whatever little loans I had left whatever little savings I had left and pretty much just went all in so I was on Medicaid for the first year of owning our practice before uh, things kind of got better and we started making money and you know could pay ourselves a little bit but yeah we just kind of <laughs> went all in uh, that's just and that's not for everybody like I'm not saying that's the, that's the way to do it my uh my fiance is graduated with, with Greg and I, and she just started her own clinic after five years of working for somebody else, but that was her path. Like for me, I'm, I'm much more of a risk taker and I was very cool just kind of betting on ourselves. Yeah, and it's much better. I mean, starting out for your fiance, like she's already fully booked, you know, she's got a full caseload. So she's developed a reputation over the years where she doesn't necessarily have as big of a risk potentially um, or you know, when we started, we didn't really have much to lose, so to speak. So it was more like everything to gain and uh, something that we wanted to try anyway. So we could always fall back on, on something else, you know, work somewhere else. If we needed yeah, to. exactly. And, and I think like, without going into too much detail on like what our initial situation was, is we thought we were going to be getting a lot of help from people that didn't end up kind of coming through, which kind of gave us like Doug said, we kind of kind of forced our hand a little bit. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. It was like, was something we had always discussed and always kind of talked about and it seems to be like now is a great time it's kind of now or never and then the people who were kind of pushing in that direction left and it was basically just kind of you know the three of us defend for ourselves which we ended up doing um but yeah like you know i wouldn't trade that for anything in the world it's been a great experience and i've enjoyed all of it it's been awesome but uh yeah i mean it's not for everybody to own their own practice like it's not for everybody to start it right away like that's just kind of the path we went like so many things happened organically for us to be able to get to where we are that like if we were to write a book about what happened over the last five years like it would not have been what i would have pictured predicting what happened at that point in time yeah and i mean like the thing, I, I had trevor talk first because he did I, I don't know if i would have done what he did in his position like greg was working somewhere else so he had a safety net i had a safety net because i had I was still in the, like, in the reserves with the military. So if I wasn't busy seeing patients, I could go make money and do that. I didn't have any debt because I had the GI bill to pay for PT school. So like, I, I had a bunch of money saved. Like, but, and, but Trevor had a bunch of debt 
And I was kind of like, look, you know, when, when, like I said, we were forced to work together. I didn't even have enough patience for myself. And because they kind of got like screwed into the situation, I'm like, well, you know, I've got to like, I've got to try to make this work for everybody. I was like, I can't, I can't even guarantee myself employment. You know, I can't guarantee you anything. And he's like, I don't care. Like I'm all in. And I'm like, all right. Like, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to everybody and neither would he. <laughs> I'm just saying that that's, that this is what we all did. And I, like, when I look back, I realize like how clueless we actually <laughs> are. We, we actually were. And it's like kind of scary, but experience was, was the best teacher. But, you know, yeah. you make a case that the time to do it might be when you just graduate, when you're already in debt anyway, and you don't have a lot invested in something else. Like, the, again, it's just yeah. it's an individual decision. It's really hard. Yeah, it's Every just, situation it's, is so unique. Yeah, it's if how you're comfortable and confident with a full caseload, then it, there's, you know, there's no wrong reason to do it. Yeah. But the bigger thing is, like, if you're going to start your own business, regardless of how secure you feel financially, you should feel secure treating people on your own without a ton of mentorship. Yes. I think we had, we had really good mentors. I mean, I kind of like cringed at some of the things that I did when I first started out, but I think that we were more ready than some other new grads because of the mentors that we had. But admittedly still, like the learning curve in the first two years of treating independently is yeah. just beyond anything else you'll experience. Um, yeah, whether you have that mentorship or not, just being in the clinic regularly and seeing patients every single day is gonna make you a way better clinician very quickly. But it's hard to do that and learn business at the same time. It can be done, but it's very hard. Um, do you want us to take James's question? It seems like it's the last one. Yeah, um, I would say sure. Uh, okay. I, yeah, let's do it. Okay, I'll take James's and then we'll do the, the extra credit after that because I just saw another one come in. That's good. But yeah, um, no so the question from James is about like, do we think strength and conditioning should be kind of part of the, uh, the curriculum for future clinicians? Again, when it comes down to should, I mean, of course, our bias is like, yeah, strength and conditioning is great because we like it. But as Dr. Stewart can attest, I don't think, and I don't even think we appreciate this until afterwards. Like, what are you going to cut out to put that in? You know, there's just so much to learn to be a journalist. I consider strength and conditioning almost just like advanced therex. So do you need to know like Olympic lifting to be a good PT? I don't think so. Cause I don't even really do, do that much of it. I think, I think probably you could get higher level therex than what most entry level programs get. But when you say, okay, this should be required. Like, I don't know if somebody who goes into PT school knowing full well, they don't want to do outpatient ortho necessarily needs to do strength and conditioning. Um, I, it's, it's really hard because I don't know, what you would cut out to make that happen because there's so much finite time and resources. Um, I think that like the, the exercise um, progressions can be a little bit probably more aggressive mm -hmm. and it could be maybe like an elective, but beyond that, I don't know how much more emphasis I would put on it because like, are you going to cut anatomy? You're going to cut kinesis? You're going to cut basic neuro, you know, you're going to cut basic cardio poem. Like even for an outpatient ortho, it's easy to say like, Oh, well, like, I'm never going to do neuro. But you think that until you're working with the spinal cord patient, like I'm working. It's not that like the class itself made me better at it, but you need to have some foundational appreciation of it. Um, and and, and to just to see like the more models you see, the more you realize like, okay, like everyone's kind of saying the same thing using different words. Um, but ultimately, again, it comes down to like, if you really want to learn it, you've got to get it on your own. But I think that there is room for it to be an, an elective and out, you know, in an ideal world, yes, there would be, some more like emphasis on fitness beyond just acute pain management. But the goal of PT school is to create a safe generalist who can then learn more through practice or through residency or fellowship. So the goal is not to make someone a specialist. Now, maybe there can be programs that cater more to that, but again, you know, there's a lot of like things with CAPD and other regulations that like kind of mandate what you can and what you can't do when it comes to entry level program. Doug, Greg, Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this was awesome. Um, if any of you folks have more questions, um, Doug said he'd be willing to hang back and uh, talk through those. Um, I just wanna, before I close, I just wanna plug our next event. Um, it's on June 17th from six to 7.30. It's um, our Disability Awareness, Vision Impairments, Blindness and Movement Strategies talk. Um, and it would be presented by Carol Mood from a nonprofit organization, Lighthouse Guild, um, and also a conversation with um, motivational speaker, Susan Robinson. 
So um, uh, looking forward to seeing you all at that. And uh, thank you again, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, everybody. So I think there's only one more question from Carmen. Just, and this is just so that you all don't feel obligated to stay beyond whatever the, the mandated time was, but for the people who didn't get to interact. I am just going to quickly say, Doug and uh, Greg and Trevor, thanks so much. I'm, I am going to uh, bug out because my family just made dinner. But, <laughs> but I think one of the, but Doug, you bring up a really good point is that if you, um, I think all of us have a level of frustration coming out of PT school with, you know, God, I wish I had, I wish I'd been prepared for this or been prepared for this. Uh, and you were totally right is something that some people don't really think about is that if you if you're going to plug something in then something's got to come out elsewhere. And what we've been really good at at Columbia is packing tons of stuff in. So if we don't take something out. Right. So then that becomes a big conversation about how's that going to happen. And we all complain that we were doing too much stuff anyway. You know, right, so exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, always, I always tell the story of taking 27 credits in one semester uh, to you know, some of the patients who might be interested in physical therapy. It's like you're right, the second spring, you're there, or the first spring, exactly. whatever it is. It's like second an impossible, spring. Yeah. impossible amount of credits. Anyway, it's really good to hear from you guys. It was so, I mean, we went from border policy to change of direction. Training. Right, there you go. Yeah. Covered all. Couldn't be better than that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the good metaphors. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Bye. thanks. Thank you. So the question from Carmen, post-COVID. Yeah, so the, this question's kind of, this is a common question with the COVID stuff. Is like basically, you know, one of the predisposing factors for injury when it comes to return to sport is this whole like acute to chronic load, which basically means that, you know, people have tried to figure out like exact ratios. But all, intuitively what it means is, if you haven't been doing that much and you, then you all of a sudden you do a lot, you're more likely to get hurt because there haven't been structured practices with COVID. There's a concern. I think it's already happening in some of the European soccer clubs that like people are more likely to get injured. So look, there's only so much control that people have. If you're working with an athlete who's not with their team now, then just try to train them as aggressively as possible with the constraints and equipment limitations that you have. So that when they go back to practice, um, they're more prepared. Beyond that, a lot of it really is not in our control as like rehab providers, because if they go to practice the first day and the coach is like, I want to see who's been grinding over the, you know, over the quarantine, like, yeah, people are probably going to get hurt. I mean, that, so that's probably where the communication piece comes in. It's like, if you have a relationship with the sport coach, you could say, look, you're probably better off the first week doing, you should feel like you did too little, not too much. Um, because people are most likely to get hurt during that initial spike in their workloads. So do the best that you can to maintain a high workload if you have control over some of their off-season training. And then beyond that, you're either just going to hope for the best, or if you have a relationship with the coach, try to talk to the coach about like education about, hey, I know you feel like you have to make up for lost time, but um, if you get everybody hurt, then that's you're making up for more lost time. So better yeah. off being conservative when it comes to that than doing too much. Yeah, and something I've been asking my athletes who are obviously not in season right now is what they're gonna have to do when they get back to practice. Like, what does your day one look like? Because they might know, they might know that they have a conditioning test that they have to do on a certain date. And that's gonna probably dictate a little bit of what I wanna do with them to A, like help prepare them so that they're not gonna be injured, but B, be successful in whatever test it is that's gonna get them playing time. Um, so it's sort of balancing, you know, what they, what you think they need versus what their coach thinks they need. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, like, yeah, do as much as you can with them. And, um, ultimately like having a proper ramp up is going to be, you know, maybe out of our hands, but the best you can do is, is good enough, I guess. Yeah, I think you guys covered it all. I think those are good answers. It's just there's controlling what you can, I think, from an X's and O's standpoint of like in terms of the, the preparation. It's like people don't have access to gyms, but you still have the outdoors. You can still, you know, do plyometrics outside to build tissue capacity. You can still do sprints and accelerations to make sure that you can handle the velocities that you need to be at once you get back to practice and then just kind of keep building up the, the, um, uh, 
work capacity of that to hopefully not get injured when you go back, depending on whatever the coach has you do. And like Doug said, I think the communication and, and knowing what to expect from a coach's standpoint when they get back is huge because if they're going to get back and they're just going to do, you know, repeat hundreds until, you know, the sun goes down, then people are probably going to get hurt. But if they go in knowing what's going to happen, it's going to be kind of more of a um, appropriate dosage that first time getting back into camp. And I think things could go a lot better. And something else too is like a lot of athletes are just doing like body weight exercises at home these days. And like, that's really it because they don't really know what else they're, they're supposed to be doing. And like probably the number one thing you should be doing is like sprinting and like some sort of fast, like just change of direction, like just running back and forth, like pretty quickly. Like it's just to boil it down and make it super simple. Like if you're going to have hamstring tears in a, in a sport like soccer, like it's probably because you weren't sprinting potentially. So you should probably be doing stuff like that because that's the stuff that's going to just drop off faster than anything else um, compared to like, you know, strength. Yeah. I just, um, for Adrian, I just actually sent the link because we did a blog post on your exact question. Well, there you go. So rather than, than just like recite the, the books, which is boring, <laughs> um, I'll just leave that for you there. Yeah. And then, if for whatever reason you lose, you guys lose the link, you can just um, Iris has the the mailing list, and then we could just we could send that to you. And we've all done like some level of shadowing and observing other professionals. So if there's ways you can do that, and whether it's locally or if you have to travel to get somebody, we've all done that, where we just spent our time watching people do what they do. So that's that was also very helpful as well. Yeah, there's definitely some good resources, you know, relatively inexpensive books and blog posts and stuff like that. So I, I kind of put together a, an article of like almost like a cheap informal fellowship for people who don't want to do a real one of like things that I think are kind of, you know, important reading for a sports centric PT, if you want to call it that. All right. Well, I suppose we'll awesome. give it another couple of seconds. If there's no more questions, uh, uh, you know, thanks really dynamic audience. I kind of knew that coming in just from the interaction that I had with, uh, with Iris and Steven. Um, but you know, we've all, we've been in your shoes and it, get, it gets better, you know, and you, you guys have it harder than yeah. we did with everything going on, but um, wish you, wish you all the best and just excited for what the future holds for all you get You're going through a great program. You've got smart classmates, professors who are knowledgeable and care. Um, and you're all going to do pretty well, as much as you might not think so right now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> we need to hear those words. <laughs> Weird um, time. We do have one last question about how, what's the best way to contact you guys if you um, want to answer that. Oh, there it is. There yeah, and then like our, our website will have all the social media links and stuff like that. But email is just our first name at resilientperformance.com. And we are happy to answer questions and help out students. Like we, like Doug said, we were in your shoes. Like we know how tough PT school can yeah. be to go through, and you feel like the light at the end of the tunnel is two million miles away, but <laughs> not that far, and you will definitely get through it. As long as you make it through the first semester, you're yeah, you know, we have, yeah. Once you get and then the first semester, you're good. Man. Yeah, well, there's people I think who haven't been to the first semester yet, but once you get through that, it's like it's it's hard, but. It's yeah. manageable. Yeah. I yeah. remember counting. I think there were 14 semesters. I remember counting and being like, all right, I'm three fourteenths of the way through. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? Yeah, like, like, feel free to email us if you have anything. It's, you, you always think that like what you're dealing with at the moment is like the worst thing you're going to deal with. It just, I'm not sure. Like, it, it gets harder, but yeah. like, kind of in a good way because when you're in the clinic, like you're going to face real problems and be responsible for people, but like it's, it's different than studying for a test, but it's not like easier, you know? Yeah. Sure. I would say it's more rewarding though. Yeah. <laughs> like cool. I'd rather be studying for a test now than dealing with a pandemic and you know, <laughs> everything else that's going on. But yeah, I just got to have a sense of humor about it. Like at the end of the day, like you, you all made it this far cause you're pretty good at standardized testing and good academically. So wh like, why is that going to really change now? Right. Um, Sweet. Amazing. Thank you guys again. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Um, take thank care. You yeah, take care. Be safe, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Bye, guys. everyone. Bye. Guys, it's good to see you again. Thank you for listening to the Resilient Performance Podcast. 
As a thank you for listening, we'd like to offer a 10% discount on our online products, which you can find at resilientperformance.com. We'd like you to use the promo code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, to get the 10% off. Right now we have the Resilient Movement Foundations course uh, online format for you to purchase there. And we hope to grow that soon before the end of the year and have some other offerings. We hope you enjoy. Again, that's promo code PODCAST, P-O-D-C-A-S-T, for 10% off. Thanks.